everybody and welcome to our webinar on business resumption. Um, today we're going to focus on what we need to think about um, coming out of COVID or planning around the next few months um, and also thinking about what we need to be doing um, now to, to make sure we're putting all those plans in action. We've got another amazing group of panellists this morning. We have uh, Catherine Burnett from KPMG, we've got Kenny Blair from Buzzworks, uh, Daryl Morrow from Udrafter, Declan Doyle, one of our ethical hackers at SVRC. We've got Tony McLennan from Adelshaw Goodard and Alistair Forbes, um, who will be given the last uh, words on summing up the webinar for us this morning, and also Paul Atkinson as well. So I'm going to hand you over to Catherine from KPMG. Thanks, Jude. I will attempt to share my slides. Let's see. Is that appearing okay for everybody? Can everybody see the slides and hear me okay? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, great. Okay. Well, thanks, Jude. Um, I think what I would say is we're we're definitely starting to hear more from clients. So I'm Catherine Burnett. I'm the regional chair for KPMG here in Scotland. Uh, and we're obviously engaging with a lot of clients. We've probably had more conversations with clients in the last four weeks than um, you know ever before. Um, we have done some polls and um, we talk about reaction, resilience, recovery, and new reality being the four phases of this crisis. And just a few weeks ago, we had 4% of our clients saying that they were in that recovery and new reality phase. And just last week, that had jumped up to 36%. So I think this is exactly the right time to be talking about how you emerge from the crisis. What I'm hoping to do is just provide a view, um, is provide our view on the economic impact, um, our assumptions and the potential scenarios, hopefully giving you something to assess your plan or decisions against. What I will say before I start is that I don't have a crystal ball um, and things are changing all the time. You know, even in the last two weeks, we've, we've seen significant movement. So we're constantly updating our economic forecasts. Um, and I will provide Jude with a link um, to where you can access sort of weekly insights that we're sending out to clients on the economic situation. So this slide really gives um, what our base case is, which is that we see GDP contracting nearly 8% in 2020, which is a combination of a sharp fall in consumer spending and overall investment, which is only partly offset by the increase in the government spending that we're seeing. Equally, um, once we see a vaccine come in and we see the, uh, the full lockdown being able to be lifted in 21, we see an uptick in GDP, again, with the same link to spending and investment. So this slide sets out what our base case assumptions are. As I say, some may take a slightly different view, but we have currently assumed that the lockdown remains in place until the end of May, but some measures such as restrictions on social gatherings and travel will remain in place until the end of 21. We also assume some additional secondary lockdowns lasting about two, three, four weeks each in the third and fourth quarter of 20. And we then assume that a vaccine becomes available in January 21, allowing the removal of all restrictions. That in some cases believe we, that may be slightly optimistic. So we think that the vaccine will be between January and maybe August of 21. So you can see that the GDP forecasts for 20 reflect that pattern of stop-start economic activity with the lockdown and continued some social distancing measures anticipated until the vaccine is found. This graph just highlights the current slowdown is unprecedented, the term that's often used on a number of levels. So one of them is the scale of the contraction that you see, and you can see that when compared to history, you're really going back to the end of World War I to see anything um, to the same level. So it's really just trying to provide some perspective as to the, the size um, of the impact that we're, we're dealing with right now. But there is some good news in that despite the severe shock to the economy in 20, we expect output to return to near pre-crisis levels sooner than in previous recessions. Um, so we believe the recession could adopt a W shape as a result of the secondary lockdowns, but once the vaccine is found, we should see a return to pre-crisis levels. 
this, this slide is really just setting out, as I said, we've got a base case, but we also have an upside case and then two further downside cases. And you can see the assumptions that we've made around that with the, the most optimistic being upside, which is that the pandemic is contained by September 20. I think we would, we would probably, we would be thinking now that is in, incredibly unlikely in terms of a vaccine being found by that point. Uh, downside too is that the, the vaccine is pushed out much further um, and that we see a number of further lockdowns, not just in third and fourth quarter this year. But I think what that can help you do is start to plot for your businesses what, what might be the impact if there were different scenarios that play out um, depending on both how the, the medical advice pans out and the vaccine. The next slide looks at sectors um, and I suspect there's nothing um, and there's no surprises in there in terms of what we're, what we're seeing. Obviously the curbs on social gatherings including after the lockdown is lifted could see a third of output in hotels and restaurants lost this year uh, and recovery potentially more challenging um, as it you know the travel plans that are cancelled and the restaurant bookings that are cancelled don't really um, come back they're lost for good. But by contrast, um, manufacturing and construction, though falling by a quarter, could see a stronger rebound because there's potentially back orders that will come back onto the books and will need to be fulfilled. Uh, the drop in manufacturing production, um, to some extent linked very much to the temporary closure of many work workforces, and is all in also impacting utility utilities output, um, given the amount of energy that's required right now. Uh, financial and professional services could see a more muted reduction in output, um, given that some of the it, it's primarily a change of how they're being delivered, with majority of staff working from home and focus being able to focus on servicing clients' needs. Um, what we are seeing is from the transport and logistics point of view, while there has been an impact in terms of the, the level of travel, um, the, the demand for home deliveries and other transport is, is helping to offset that. What you can see at the very bottom of this graph is that obviously, given the nature of the crisis, the main rise in output is concentrated in public health services. Um, so we're, we're seeing that increase. The next slide looks at it on a location or geography basis. Uh, and this uh, takes you through the different regions and how we think they will be impacted. So the region we feel will have the biggest impact is the West Midlands. We forecast its economy will contract by just over 10%, primarily due to its links to the automotive sector, um, making up 6% of the local economy, and then also the broader supply chain within that region. And at the other end, we expect London will be the least affected, primarily due to the financial professional services um, and the capital's economy just being a bit more resilient um, to some of the restrictions. But if you look at Scotland, it's obviously just sitting two places above London, so faring reasonably well. Um, agree, I think, again, we believe that's due to the diverse workforce, flexible services-led economy, and a good mixture of industries, meaning that we're in a strong position against other areas of the country, albeit we do recognise that the tourism industry in particular in Edinburgh and Scotland more broadly um, will, will be impacted. A couple more slides I'll just touch on. This one is on the unemployment rate, which again, you can see it compares the unemployment to other recessions. Uh, we believe that due to the government's job retention scheme and pretty low unemployment prior to the crisis, the unemployment rate could be lower than in previous recessions, despite the severity of the downturn. What we, what we are starting to look at now is, is that just a delay in unemployment and once things like the JRS scheme um, start to, to tail off, will there be a delayed impact of, of the crisis? Um, in terms of inflation, despite the weaker pounds and cuts in output production, inflation is expected. We expect to remain low this year and next year. Um, and so while the pandemic represented a shock to both demand and supply um, in the economy, it's expected that the shock of the demand is expected to dominate, which will keep inflation low. Um, so in some ways, a good thing in terms of interest rates. Final slide um, before I wrap up is just really what is all of this doing to um, government debt? And this is, this is using estimates from OBR, which shows that government debt could rise to nearly 95% of GDP. 
So what's that based on? Well, it's looking at government spending, um, also the fact that their revenues will be hit by some of the, the tax announcements in terms of deferral of tax payments um, and a slowing economy. What hasn't been built into this um, estimate right now is the, the cost of the loan guarantees and some of the other schemes that are they are running. Um, so I think there's there's probably some updates to be made there. But what it does highlight is that the ratio is at its highest level since around 1962-63. Um, but equally, you can see that it was at its peak uh, of 251 in, in the aftermath of the Second World War. So we're, we're certainly not up at those types of levels. But what I think it does highlight is, as that has increased, what will be the impact um, in the future of, of the government having that level of debt in terms of future fiscal policy, for example, around taxes. So again, that's something that I suspect will emerge over the coming months. So that was all of my slides. Um, sorry, that was a whistle top tour, tour, but we've all been warned by Jude to keep within time. So I hope I have done that. Um, and I will um, stop sharing so that Jude can take over and obviously happy to take any questions. I think actually it was Kenny Blair that was bossier than me about timing. So <laughs> let's see how good he is now. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going just to share my screen. Can you see that? No, it's not sharing. That's it now. That's it now. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Just put it on to uh, slide show. All right. Am I the other way around? Is that it now? Still coming up at all the slides and the things. So just if you can press, you know, the bottom where it says slide show, the, the wee icon. Use slideshow. That's it. Does it get subtitles at the bottom? No. No. Okay. Good. Uh, well, good morning, uh, everyone. My name's Kenny Blair. I'm in the dreaded hospitality sector. Uh, only the second worst hit uh, in all of this um, this uh, crisis. Um, for those of you who don't know our business, um, we've got we're a primarily a West Coast uh, based uh, company. We've got 12 venues, uh, one in the East and South Queens Ferry, the rest are all predominantly in the West. We were in the middle of uh, building a new one in Linlithgow and we had another further three in the pipeline. Um, we employ about over 500 staff and we're a Sunday Times 100 best companies to uh, work for uh, company. We are primarily a local uh, based business. We typically operate in uh, towns of sort of 15 to 40,000. We don't get a lot of business uh, from the tourist trade as such, which I, which I suppose is a bit of a, a, a bonus. Um, I, I thought I would just uh, take you through uh, a bit of the groundwork um, and I think it's important to touch on that about what we did at the start of this crisis, which I think has stood us in good stead uh, with uh, hospitality being heavily reliant on people. Um, one thing uh, was that we, we had a pretty steady hand on the way down. We didn't make any uh, knee-jerk reactions um, when the, uh, all the announcements were being made. Uh, we didn't uh, scare anyone. We tried to make our people as safe as possible. Um, we focused on simple communication. Uh, we told our workforce what they needed to know, when they needed to know it. We didn't speculate too hard. Um, and that has been a, a common theme uh, throughout you know, this last six, seven, eight weeks. Um, I've got here, have we seen this before? We certainly, and uh, I uh, own the business with my brother and sister, and we've been in business uh, or the business has existed for over 40 years and we've had a fair share of challenges uh, in that time, including an insurance repudiation for a fire. Um, so we have seen quite a number of challenges before, which I suppose has stood us in quite good stead to uh, cope with this one. But So we didn't panic. Uh, first thing 
we did once we had the business uh, where it needed to be in terms of hibernation was um, make sure that we had absolute crystal clear numbers. Uh, our head of finance, our in-house accountant, has been working really, really hard. Uh, scenario planning, as I'm sure all the FDs up and down the country have been, the smoke coming out of his uh, keyboard. Um, but he has produced some really crystal clear numbers, um, which has helped with the planning of what we do uh, during this crisis, including dealing with the, our funders, the bank, basically. Um, what we've done is we've focused, we've, we've chosen a, a path or a plan uh, based on what we know, as, as uh, Catherine was saying, no one has a crystal ball, uh, but we have chosen a, a, a base case uh, to, uh, to have a, a plan with, and we've produced some really clear numbers, which has made it easy for the bank to say yes and support us. So we have the, apart from the fact that we're, we're on uh, solid foundations, we have the, the capital to withstand what would be, I think, a worst case scenario. Like I say, we've got a confident plan um, and we have shared that with our team. Um, I, uh, I took some advice from a, a, a gentleman who was on a webinar in an organisation I'm involved in. Uh, it was a, a gentleman called Chris Payton, who was a commander in the Royal Marines. And uh, he, he said that in times of uncertainty, you have to have a plan uh, that you share with your team. You've got to be honest with them and say that you don't have a crystal ball and you don't know if it's 100% correct, but it's a plan that everybody can work to. And I suppose it gives them some sort of anchor to uh, work with. The other thing that uh, we have been uh, pretty fastidious over is forensic control over everything in the business. Uh, we've been making sure that every penny is being looked at, uh, no stone is left unturned. And uh, we're making sure we've got tight control over everything that happens. And that will include when we come out of the, when we eventually come out of lockdown and start to get reopened. I'm a bit of an, op uh, an optimist at heart. And um, I'd like to think that, you know, we're going to come out of this uh, stronger. And certainly we're using this crisis as an opportunity to look at, to stop and look at what we're doing and to see how we can improve on what we're doing, improving our cost base, et cetera. Um, I listened to a, 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 someone talking about it, and I, I love this, I love this uh, quote, don't let a good recession go to waste. So we are certainly doing that. We're, we're making sure that uh, we are going to be fit for purpose coming out of this, because it's going to, obviously, we're going to have a period where we are not going to be able to expand quite so quickly. So um, we are making sure that we are absolutely fit and ready. So moving on to the new normal, uh, I put this slide up, one of my friends sent me this. Um, I've got to say that this isn't going to be the future of hospitality. I think social distancing and um, all the health and safety measures um, are going to be quite incompatible with hospitality. I think there's a level of health and safety that we're going to have to incorporate and safety is certainly going to be high on the agenda, but it's not going to be uh, like this. I can't, as I was saying earlier to someone, I, I can't imagine getting into a restaurant and being served uh, by someone wearing a, a face mask and gloves. Uh, and I am an optimist that I think the, the rules will be relaxed at some point in the next few months once we know more about the virus. So the real new, new normal. Um, safety is going to be high on the agenda. Um, absolutely, I think it's, it, we're going to have to reassure both our customers and our staff uh, that it's either a safe place to visit or a safe place to work. And I think that's going to be the, the number one key thing for us. We have excellent systems in the business and I'm so delighted that we've invested in them prior to this. We've got great operational systems which is going to make it easy for us to be able to have safety on the agenda and have the compliance standards that we're going to need. Uh, both 
again, from our staff and from a customer point of view. In terms of, uh, obviously, we're forecasting quite a substantial uh, drop in our sales over the next year and a bounce back the following year. And um, one of the things I've been doing while well, I've been in charge of the business is making sure that we have a structure in place for growth. And we were on quite a, a sharp growth stra uh, strategy. Um, I'm very pleased that we had a structure in place, especially with our central team, to cope with that growth. And obviously now we're not growing we uh, don't need as many people in the, the central team. And what we're doing is we're going to try and keep the structure in place and work imaginatively with our teams and try and uh, make sure that we have all the positions in place and maybe people job sharing or going part time or sabbaticals uh, and all sorts of ideas to try and keep the people in place because this is going to be, this is going to be a temporary um, I keep using that word with the team. It's a, these are all temporary measures we're putting in place. Um, and we are going to return to growth in the next 18 months, in my opinion. And lastly, if I can finish off, and it, it's how I started, is, uh, is clear communications. One of the things we've been focused on in the business is communicating clearly to our people. I do a, a daily update every, every evening, uh, trying to keep everybody up to, up to date and engaged. And we're going to make sure that we've got clear communications to our customers as well, to give them the, the uh, knowledge and the, uh, the, the thought that they can come into a place that's going to look after them. So that when the buzz returns, they choose us. And thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Did I do eight minutes? I didn't time you. I was hoping you were a professional and you do that yourself. <laughs> uh, thank you very much Kenny and some really good messaging around uh, not panicking and having a plan and clear communications and also the thing around having a uh, safe environment for customers and also for staff as well so you guys have a lot of work to do and um, I hope that the business community and everybody in, the, in these webinars will get behind you especially for Scots and St Queen's Ferry is my local and also we're looking forward to Linithgow opening up as well so thank you very much for all your support today you're welcome. And now we have Daryl Morrow. Hi guys, I'm just, can you hear me okay? Is that all right? Cool. Um, so yes, thank you um, very much. Uh, my name is Daryl Morrow. I'm the co-founder and director of Udrafter. Um, I think it's best to sort of give you a little bit of a, a brief history um, about what it is that we do. So. Um, I studied at Robert Gordon University in, in Aberdeen and finished my degree in social sciences. And I had lots of different graduate job interviews lined up and um, got to the final stage in most of them. And I kept getting the same feedback that I didn't have enough work experience, but I needed those jobs to, to get that work experience. So it was kind of this vicious cycle um, that kept going around. So I thought there must be an easier way for me to gain direct degree relevant experience quickly and get paid for it. And um, so that's why we came up with, with UDrafter, um, which stands for the University Draft. So UDrafter is a, an online platform where businesses can get on-demand access to student talent and students get paid to complete degree relevant projects. So our mission is really to eliminate unpaid internships and removing that sort of who you know barrier um, to social mobility. So we dub ourselves the home of micro internships. So different from your, your traditional internships, the, the micro aspect is anywhere from two hours to, to 50 hours in length. So really chunking that down. So what I really wanted to speak to, to everyone about today is the impact of the coronavirus, um, not only on employers and hiring activities with graduate recruitment, but also on the, the corona class, as they're calling it, of 2020. Um, where we have around 800,000 students leaving this year um, who are in this sort of pool um, of, of unemployment that's facing them on their doorstep. So um, this has meant that uh, companies are already announcing that they're scrapping this year's internship or placement program, leaving the graduates and students wondering how they'll get this sort of vital foot in the door and what it means for graduate recruitment this year sort of generally. So According to the survey of the Times top uh, 100 graduate employers, graduate recruitment this year was expected to rise by 3.3%. 
um, on top of an increase of 6.2% last year. And in the same survey conducted in December 2019, it also found that 3%, um, there's meant to be a 3% increase expected in work experience places this year for graduates and students. Now, this was before coronavirus reached the shores of the UK um, and before it sort of sent the economy down into this, this recession that we're now facing. So one thing that I really want to highlight is the occupational scarring that this is causing and will cause um, for the foreseeable future that the crisis cohort that entered sort of the world of work in the midst of the previous recession um, continued to face higher unemployment, lower pay, worse job prospects up to 10 years later compared to sort of other young people entering the workforce before or after the downturn. So at the moment, there's 5.5 billion pounds worth of student debt in Scotland and 121 billion pounds in England, which brings to a total of 83% of student loans now facing the prospect of never being paid back in full, which is quite staggering, um, forcing things up like universal credit claims um, and, and the rest of it on top of that. So um, in, the, in a similar report, um, the Times Top 100 graduate employers um, just alone with those hundred employers, they said to be they were said to be offering thirteen and a half thousand paid internships and work experience placements this year. Now, the importance of these placements is born out of um, the same company stating that in today's competitive job market, it was either not very likely or not like not likely at all that a graduate who had no previous work experience at all with any employers would be successful during their selection process. Um, and be made a job offer irrespective of their academic achievements or the university that they actually attended. So we don't, we, who knows what the impact this pandemic has had on those planned three, uh, 13 and a half thousand opportunities, but we can be sure that it's going to be substantial with 800,000 student leaders in the UK now facing these problems. So this is why it's really crucial that alternative ways of allowing students and graduates and businesses to access each other needs to be found in creative ways immediately or else we'll see this pipeline blocked and the talent flow will will dry up so students are at major risk of um, missing out on crucial experience that could be the difference between getting a graduate job offer or being unemployed when they leave university or college so at UDRAFTER we chunk the workload of a traditional internship into micro projects like I explained um, so students track their work through completion, giving complete transparency of the work carried out remotely. Um, so the students are paid weekly at a rate that's set by the employer, and we handle all the payroll, all the HMRC compliance, student insurance, right to work checks, and education checks. So once the student has completed their project, it's reviewed and added to their profile for other employers to view, um, helping them to attract better graduate employment offers. So companies can actually perform and conduct their summer programs remotely. And the UDRAF, their micro internship model, allows companies to post projects from as little as two hours. And this means employers can actually strip back the scope of their usual programs without removing them completely. So I'd like to highlight just now a bit of a case study of a, case study of a company that we're currently working with. Let's take a little drink there, um, getting a bit dry. Um, so this company is based in Aberdeen. Uh, they're called Prism Energy. So they were looking for a digital marketing student or a recent graduate to help uh, create a new company brochure, update their website content, uh, refresh their search engine optimization, and create a structured marketing and plan moving forward. So they've just begun publishing their first brochure that the student has created, um, and the current assignment is going really well. So this project is for 50 hours at 15 pounds per hour, and it's completely remote. Um, 80 percent of our projects prior to COVID um, were also completed remotely, although we do do face to face as well. So the main output for the business is that they're able to continue operating their business effectively during COVID, utilizing a cost effective, sorry, <laughs> remote expertise from a local student. But one of the big things that hit home for me and what we're facing on a day-to-day -day basis is that um, due to COVID, this student that they've been working with, their previous university placement was cancelled. 
However, she's been given the opportunity to continue to gain practical experience remotely through a UDRAFT or micro internship. So I got some comments from the business um, and I sort of quote here that her quality of work is superb and she's great to deal with. And the student as well um, commented that it was a clear scope for the assignment, really good guidance offered throughout and she really enjoyed getting some more experience with this project. So to summarize, companies like L'Oreal, Indeed, Deloitte, Morgan Stanley have fully canceled their summer programs. And there are fears that as companies set to make far reaching decisions in the coming weeks, um, that we don't fully understand the competitive damage canceling these internships might do for, for the many years to come. So as companies look to the future, hiring and rebuilding their workforce will be at the top of agenda when COVID dissipates. Um, so maintaining a meaningful student intern experience will be imperative, not just for companies wanting to bounce back, but also for students to rely on these experiences to secure future work. So I'd implore people um, to, to start utilizing different ways through e-learning, upskilling their staff and other forms of technology where they can continue to operate effectively, which I'm no doubt you've all started to do. Um, I have a fantastic summary of a, um, uh, an infographic here that I can pass on to Jude. Um, but thank you so much, and I welcome any questions that you have. Thanks, Daryl. And um, the reason why I've asked Daryl on the call as well is because I think it's really important um, not to forget about our students as well. Um, and the next speaker is um, one of our amazing students, one of our hackers here at SBRC, and who I will be speaking to about the UDRAFTER model after this because I could see him looking at me going, hmm, we could do that. <laughs> Uh, so over to Declan, who prepares um, the daily uh, papers for Scottish Government and Police Scotland as well around any kind of cyber COVID related incidents or any kind of hacks and stuff that are out there. So he'll give you a run through um, talking about stuff like that, but also about how we take the plasters off. So everything has been done kind of an interim basis around cyber for most organisations in the last few months. So how do we make sure we're prepared going forward? Thanks, Declan. Thanks, Jude. Uh, and uh, it was interesting to hear as well um, from Daryl about the, the class, the COVID class of 2020. And uh, that's a, a new name for uh, for myself. I might might end up putting that in my, my Twitter bio at some point. Um, but yeah, today I wanted to talk <clears throat> to you all about your cyber strategy going forward. Um, and as Jude said there, uh, we kind of, as lockdown hit, we just kind of stuck a plaster on um, our current cyber strategies uh, and we had a very temporary solution uh, but as we're seeing now going forward the temporary solution it looks like now is going to be very long term uh, we've seen uh, already that we're not sure exactly when a vaccine could come it could be as far away as 18 months uh, which means that home working is, is looking like it's going to be the new normal uh, and that kind of brings up a lot of problems, particularly when it comes to cybersecurity. So what I want to, to talk about today is really looking at a working from home policy and one that is, is suited to uh, the, the new normal and what you should consider. So I'll not go into too much detail, um, but I will highlight you know, several key points that I think are worth consideration and you should start talking about it now so that when lockdown is eventually relaxed, we do have policies in place, which means that working from home uh, is, is a lot easier. And uh, just in case we have to go back into lockdown, uh, there's a smooth transition and we can all uh, not hurt too much over that. So the first is uh, your device policy. Uh, so lockdown was kind of announced, um, you know, there was rumors when it was gonna start, but it was kind of announced pretty quickly. Uh, and so there wasn't a lot of preparation that went into it. So a lot of people um, might not have had work devices at their house. They may have had, uh, not had the chance to get them from the office. Uh, and likewise, they might not have even had work uh, devices to begin with. They might only have had a work desktop in their office. Um, so we're now looking at a lot of homework and being done on home devices, such as your personal mobile phone and personal laptops and computers. Uh, and so it's now time to decide, are we going to issue staff with new um, devices? And obviously that comes with a, a, um, an increased cost uh, in a time where 
Um, not every organization is going to have the, the cash flow to, to spend on that. Uh, so we need to start looking at um, what are, what are um, the policies when it comes to using your home devices um, and, and surrounding uh, security implications on that. Um, so for example, uh, it's now uh, an individual's responsibility to keep your personal device up to date um, because uh, if you're anything like me, you're, you're probably quite reluctant to give control of your own personal devices away. Uh, so it, it then becomes your responsibility to keep them up to date and following on from that, the software and services you're using, are they up to date uh, and things like that. Also looking at software and services, uh, have you picked appropriate tools for the job you're doing? Uh, we've seen a lot of hysteria over the past few weeks in lockdown about Zoom. So has that meant that you've stayed away from Zoom uh, when in actual fact it would be quite an ideal solution for you? Or um, maybe the opposite, you've heard about Zoom uh, because it was kind of massively adopted and you've just decided that's what the tool we're going to use without actually researching all the others out there. Um, and you might find that there are plenty of other tools out there that, that might even work better for you. Um, so as a side note as well, we at the SBRC have released a little fact sheet on all the various video conferencing tools you can use uh, with pros and cons for each, um, coming from a business and a cybersecurity perspective as well. So I'd strongly recommend you to check that out. Um, as well, have you had a look at any sort of collaborative tools um, for, for you know, word processing, uh, PowerPoints and things like that? And, and talking about the collaborative tools, uh, when we're looking at files and data and, and sharing these files and data, how are you doing work now? Are you uh, writing up a Word document and then emailing it to your colleague so that they can provide feedback? Or are you sharing a link through OneDrive or something like that? Um, an important thing to consider is if you are sharing files through email, um, what happens if that email address becomes compromised? then that file is then also um, compromised. Uh, is that a client confidential report, for example? Is that an internal report that you wouldn't want to be leaked? Um, if you share that through OneDrive, you can revoke access to the link. Uh, you can allow the link to only be opened by certain people. Uh, so you get a bit of access control back, even working in this collaborative new homeworking environment. Uh, and then and talking about data as well, who has access to the data, um, is it, is it a case of a company-wide um, file sharing service? Uh, are, do, people, do all people need access to these files? Things like that. We just have to consider uh, the implications of uh, the access control models we have now when we're working from home. Again, talking about kind of shared file servers, uh, corporate networks, and VPNs. So working from home, uh, you might need access to your corporate network and you're looking at various VPN tools uh, to do that. First of all, I would ask you to consider, do you actually need access to your corporate network? Uh, because with every person that has access to it, that is another attack vector uh, for a malicious user to, to use. So if work can be done, say I've used the example of OneDrive a lot, can you use OneDrive to store some of the less important documents in your organization? And so only using that rather than actually having a, no a network to VPN into. Uh, these are just things that I think are worth consideration. Uh, another point is joint accounts. Uh, so for example, we have, uh, um, or we've seen a lot more people using Zoom and there's probably a lot more people using uh, the enterprise level uh, Zoom. So that's one account that um, many people are using. Uh, how are you sharing the passwords for these accounts? Uh, same uh, example can be used with social media. A lot of organizations now have company or, or organizational social media, and uh, maybe multiple people need access to this. How are, how are you sharing the access to this? It's, we're no longer working face-to-face -face in an office, so it's, it's no longer any case of sharing the passwords easily. Um, is it time to start looking at, at say, a password manager? Um, for organizational passwords. It's a far more secure way of sharing passwords. Uh, also, are you sharing passwords through email? Um, are you sharing them through, say, WhatsApp or text? You know, how can you ensure the integrity of these messages? And once that password gets out there, um, 
you know, you would need to change it and then again, sharing, sharing it, would you share it through the same medium? It's just things to consider. Um, so I would strongly recommend on this point to look into a password manager for sharing uh, and joint accounts. But there are various other solutions that you can look into to see what works best for you. As well, training and awareness. Now I think more important than ever is, is making sure staff are aware of the responsibilities uh, they now have when it comes to, to cyber and working from home. Uh, how is this training and awareness going to be issued? Um, are, you, are you encouraging staff to come and check out webinars such as such as this? Um, or, or are there places uh, that you can go to? Is someone compiling maybe a list of, of recommended things to look at while we're working from home? Uh, and then also briefly talking about your incident response. So uh, hopefully most organizations now are, are, are kind of thinking about what to do in the event of a cyber incident. And that's, that's all well and good when we're working in an office. But now what happens when everyone's working from home and someone um, picks up the phone and says, I think my uh, email account has been compromised. I think I've been hacked. hacked. What do you do in that instant, um, instance? Do we have a plan for that? It's time to start thinking about uh, what happens if an organization is, is suffering a cyber attack when everyone is at working from home. Uh, and finally, uh, to touch, I would like to touch on the culture and support. Um, I think this is this is a universal um, topic that can be can be applied to any aspect of, of business, but particularly coming from a, a cyber perspective, uh, there is a lot of pressure on people to, you know, check an email to make sure it's not a phishing email. Don't click on suspicious links. Don't download any piece of software you're not sure about. Things like that. It's important to to have a positive culture around these things. Um, we don't want to have a blame culture uh, that would maybe perhaps uh, make someone less likely to come forward uh, if, if they do think they have been a victim of some sort of cyber incident. And there should be that support network in place. People should know who to speak to about these things. Uh, and we should be supporting people through if they have been victim to a cyber attack and, and making sure that they're they're not feeling guilty about it because people do make mistakes and it's going to happen to some of us. Uh, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about that. And we have seen that there is a massive increase um, in COVID related phishing emails and, and scams and things like that. And I would strongly encourage you to, to check out some of our previous webinars on, on those topics. Uh, so it is important to, to have this positive culture and, and positive support network. Yeah, but in the, in the instance and, and, keeping conscious of time and this, this very strict eight-minute eight, eight minute, uh, limit that's been set to us, uh, that's it from me. Um, but I would strongly encourage you to check out some of the previous stuff that we've produced at SBRC and no doubt we'll have more in the future. But thank you very much. Uh, and I'll pass you back to Jude. Thank you, Declan. Um, next is Tony McLennan from Adelshaw Goodard, um, who's going to go through the legal aspects of around business resumption. Tony, you need to come off on mute on your screen. So sorry, I've uh, eaten up a precious 20 seconds there being on mute. Um, I'm going to walk you all through uh, considerations around regulatory matters and health and safety legislation that you will need to have atten uh, pay attention to when considering returning to work or indeed if you've already returned to work. Now, one of the difficulties has been that we've had this welter of guidance and regulation uh, since the end of March. It's been a little overwhelming. It's been difficult even for the most uh, avid reader and the most conscientious reader to take hold of. Uh, and I've put some of these up, just some of it, the more general ones up on this slide here. And there's also been this conflation, I think, in the media, in the public, and the government have contributed to it between what is regulation and what is guidance. So put simply, regulation is legislation and it carries uh, penalties in, uh, if you breach it, whereas guidance, it doesn't have that compulsory nature. But uh, what you will have to consider if you think about departing from guidance is the other legal implications of it. Will it leave you, um, first of all, is it the right thing to do to depart from the guidance? 
Secondly, will it leave you exposed if something goes wrong in terms of civil suit? Uh, will it leave you exposed in terms of the health and safety legislation, which we'll return to? Will it, if uh, business uh, acts against guidance, just promote government regulating it? And will it carry any reputational damage? I put a quote up there uh, on the screen, which just shows that some of the language which government has used, and it's a rushed process for them, I think this comes from the Scottish Government's advice to business, uh, has tended to be apt to confuse, and some of the guidance has presented itself almost as regulation, when in fact it's not. So I've got three steps that I think you need to look at in general terms to return to work. First of all, first of all, to look at what the coronavirus restriction regulations in Scotland, and they're separate in Scotland, say about this matter. So there's question one is, can you operate at all? So there'll be some businesses, and Kenny will be in that field at the moment, which are simply not permitted to operate. They're either subject to such severe restrictions or have been made the subject to compulsory closure. So these are pubs, cinemas, and other businesses which implicitly carry the large gatherings of the public. Now, you'll see the list in the, the schedule uh, in the, the regulations, so that's easily determined, and of course, you already know it in reality. But then, what do the regulations otherwise affect your operations? So there's two principal features to that. The first of all is the travel restriction. Can you man your operation? So the travel restrictions at present time mean that you can't leave your home to travel to work unless uh, it's not reasonably possible to carry out that work from home. So that's a principal a, a restriction that's affecting operations at the moment. And I've advised clients who've had a, a employees turned around both in England and in Scotland by the police, certainly in the early stages of it. The second uh, uh, restriction regulation facet, which you will have to consider, is regulation 41A to C, which are, are the social or safe, or I prefer the term physical distancing measures. Now, these have now been adopted into regulation for all businesses which are operating, with the exception of care businesses. And that means that all businesses are required to take all reasonable measures to ensure uh, the physical distance of two metres between persons on the, uh, on the premises. So that in itself, uh, put in regulation, uh, is, the, is the single biggest, or the, one of the biggest restrictions uh, in terms of business operation. But let's say that you consider, uh, and I think many businesses can, you can overcome uh, those uh, hurdles either in home or in part. Then how do you uh, proceed from there? Now, what we mustn't lose sight of, and health and safety uh, is not ordinarily considered uh, as having wide application. It's seen as generally, I think, uh, being something which would affect heavy industry uh, or um, manual industries. But it's now going to have a huge effect across the panoply of business. So the Health and Safety at Work Act uh, carries the overarching obligation upon employers uh, to, uh, to uh, provide a safe place of work wherever that is, or to take such measures to provide a safe place of work uh, as are reasonably practicable. Now that applies not just to your employees, but also to your customers, suppliers, or anyone else who is directly affected by your business operating. Now, we'll come back to what taking all reasonable practical measures is, but you can see that um, when you're analysing what uh, allows for a safe workplace, the risk of the transmission of the coronavirus is clearly uh, going to be something that impacts upon that. How do you deal with that? Principally, you have to risk assess. Now, that's a statutory obligation in terms of the 74 Act, and also in terms of uh, the 1999 Management of Health and Safety Regulations. So you need to look at what control measures you can put in place either to eliminate or to appropriately minimise or reduce the risk of transmission of the virus. Well, what is a sufficient and suitable risk assessment? My first tip to you would be use your workforce force to make that determination. Those are the persons who know your workplace best. They know the workaround, the pitfalls, the minutiae of it. Minutiae of it. So they will be able to um, assist you in creating a proper detailed risk assessment across all of your operations. And what's more, you'll get 
employee buy-in. So you'll get better compliance once those measures are up and running and you'll reduce the risk of reputational damage. So at the beginning of this, and indeed still, uh, we were advising some clients who were getting uh, reputational difficulties with disgruntled employees complaining to the press uh, and ultimately to regulators about their perception that the control measures around the risk weren't sufficient. So what does reasonably practicable measures mean in terms of health and safety legislation? So it means that you have to put in place measures to eliminate or minimise the risk, but these, um, risk, uh, these uh, measures need to be balanced against uh, practicability in terms of time, trouble and money. But what is reasonably practicable here is mainly because it's a very singular risk going to be measured against the guidance that exists at present. Now, the guidance that exists at present is developing fast um, and government are adopting a cautious and a fairly high level approach to what they're prepared to say to business about what should be done. It's centered around the concepts of physical distancing, and I'll use that terminology because it's more applicable to the workplace, uh, and good hygiene. Principally, they're still discouraging businesses from operating. That will probably change in England to some degree on Sunday, but it hasn't been changed by uh, the, um, the Scottish framework document that came out uh, yesterday. The guidance that has been uh, issued down uh, from central government has mainly in its most granular form, and it's still very high level, come from Public Health England. And they've looked at things such as uh, staggering break and uh, studies times and break times with a view to reducing the flow of persons coming in uh, to the building, coming out of the building at the same time, going into certain rooms at the same time. And in that same vein, having different entry and exit points Reconfiguring the geography of your workplace to allow for one-way flow through building. Controlling access and egress so that you can have a good idea or control over the numbers in the premises or building. Looking at how you use lifts and staircases. Generally reviewing the layout of the building to factor in the two metre physical distance. Uh, having appropriate signage or demarcation around the safe distance and also around uh, the necessity of hand hygiene and other hygiene measures around respiratory hygiene. But what it's going to mean is having appropriate or appropriate numbers of hand washing stations or hand, hand sanitizing stations, particularly around key high touch points uh, in buildings to prevent what they refer to as fomite transmission from hard surfaces. And that would be particularly germane to office space uh, and de uh, hot desking as we know it is likely to uh, be put to one side and there'll be dedicated workspaces, I suspect, with reduced numbers in the work space or spaces used on a rotor basis and appropriately cleaned in between users. So government are not going into granular detail as you would expect. They're rather leaving it to industry uh, to sort out themselves and to conduct their own risk assessments. What you need by way of measure, we had uh, we recently saw that um, Bentley are about to recommence uh, operations, and they had indicated that they had approximately 250 control measures in place uh, within their site that weren't there before. Now that's a huge manufacturing uh, uh, obligation, but you understand that it will need that level of detail. Thus far. The health and safety executive have taken a light touch and have deferred to the health authorities, but we are starting to see a more assertive tone from them. Enforcement is probably going to be in the form of guidance at the present time, but you can't rule out the prospect of a prohibition notice shutting down an occupation or operation that they don't consider as safe, or even at a later stage of prosecution. Going forward, it's clear that in England we're going to get a granular or more granular um, guidance provided on Sunday. Uh, in Scotland, I have to say that uh, there was very little uh, that was tremendously helpful in the government's document on uh, published the day before yesterday. It appears that uh, they are um, being very much guided by the R number above all else, and that's fine, but it would be more helpful, I think, to provide a better, more detailed structure about how business can engage with them with a view to 
uh, finding safe methods of returning to work. 11 minutes, I make that. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're going to get fined. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. And now it's over to Alistair Forbes. Thanks, Jade. Well, I'm supposed to get another call in 90 seconds. Um, so I'm going to go through this at quite a clip. Um, but um, thanks for the opportunity to speak to everybody again. Um, what I wanted to cover was just some thoughts around setting and resetting expectations um, in companies as um, things start to come out of the restrictions we've been under. Um, it's still clear from a number of things that we said already that you know, survival remains job number one for um, pretty much every company uh, and making sure that you've got plans in place, but be it financial, operational and everything um, to ensure that you can survive. But assuming that you have that in place, it's really now time to set the course of the way forward. I think there's a number of aspects to that. Uh, clearly, this whole um, situation has been a massive shock to companies and their staffs. Um, and I think as things start to transition back out, it's going to be really important to, to revisit and reinforce your core values as a company. What's important to you as a company and to your team? Um, I think that includes telling your team what's going to stay the same and what's going to be different because things are not going to go back to the way they were before um, universally. We all know that. I think there are a number of aspects around thinking about how your customers' businesses will have changed. Um, do you need to think about the customers you've traditionally targeted? Um, how has it impacted their businesses? Do you need to think about changing your, your value proposition to them and, and the way you go about messaging to them? Uh, how do you um, continue to convince them that you're an important supplier to them? And how, how do you maintain a position of, uh, or attain a position of being a need to have product or service as opposed to a nice to have? I think it's gonna be really important, as Kenny said in his presentation earlier, to be realistic, but optimistic. Um, I think companies have got to be honest about how the business is actually performing. Um, certainly most of my experiences in the tech sector and I think too many companies are not really being honest with themselves about how the business is performing. And, uh, and also, to be frank, some investors have been quite lax um, in their reaction to that. Uh, there's been a view in the tech sector that there's all, always going to be another funding round available. If we don't make the numbers, we'll just raise another round. Um, you know, and too many companies, you see that the only KPI that they ever hit is the, the amount of money they said they'd spend. Um, and it really is like, you know, a puppy is not just for Christmas, targets are not just for pitch decks. Um, you know, it's important to share the targets with the team, talk about how you're going to achieve them, how you're going to deliver them. And to make it clear that if the targets are not met, then it is possible that the survival of the business will be at risk. And every in the company needs to feel responsibility for delivery of the performance of the business. It's not just the management team or the board, it's the whole company. And I think um, this is a really good opportunity to use this as a way to, to increase the transparency in your business if, if it's not always been there, um, to make sure that everybody understands what's really critical, what's important. And you know, to get from the situation of being on the back foot that everybody's been forced onto, to start getting onto the front foot again. Um, we know it's not going to be the same, so how can we come back stronger uh, as a result of this? I think again, uh, you know, he talked about re revisiting the fundamentals in the business, uh, really re-examining everything that companies have been doing. What uh, of that is still important? What's more important? What might be less important? One of the things that was touched on earlier as well was the, the job retention scheme, the furlough scheme. A lot of companies put staff on furlough, but in speaking with CEOs, it's clear that you know, a proportion of those people who put on furlough were the weaker performers and a significant proportion of them may not come back. And I think that's going to have some knock-on impacts as well. I think, you know, there will be more people made redundant than have been so far. And that's going to have an impact on consumer spending. And therefore, businesses are going to continue to be very cost conscious. And so they're going to continue to scrutinize the spending that they're making and, and really reevaluate how important it is. Um, I think on this theme of how do you move from defense to attack, um, looking for what are the new opportunities that exist? Uh, you know, which verticals might be less attractive as targets, but which might be more so? And it's gonna be really important to emphasize agility. Uh, so much is uncertain. Uh, it's really important to look at the data in the business and to be ready to course correct, either to address challenges that were unforeseen 
or to go after opportunities that, that weren't um, anticipated as well. Um, startup and scale-up businesses are, are supposed to be all about rapid learning and iteration. Um, and it's going to be particularly important to do that in the, the period as we transition out of the situation that we're in right now. Um, scenario planning is going to be really important um, and being ready to, to change course, to correct course if, if necessary. I think another aspect is that uh, people have learned a lot about flexible working and the need for explicit communication with people when they're remote working. And I think most people would say that, you know, the, there are actually a lot of learnings that have come out of that that can be taken into the future. Even as companies start to move back to their workplaces, I think it's much more likely that there will be people who will say that they would like more flexible working arrangements. So I think, you know, thinking ahead about that and planning for it is going to be really important. I think just to, to close on the, you know, let's be optimistic front, this too will pass. Um, and I think for companies um, looking at, you know, how can they become a better company in the medium term than they were before the crisis hit um, is the phase that everybody should be in now. Um, the, the defensive planning uh, and, and making sure that you've got sufficient cash in the business um, is going to be ongoing. But now really is the time, I think, to be looking for how do you make changes that are really going to make your business stronger than it's ever been in the medium term. So thanks. Thanks for that, Jude. Thank you very much, Alistair, and sorry for delaying you on your call. Um, over to Paul. Yeah, thanks, Jude. Um, well, first of all, can I just thank all of the speakers for coming on the call this morning? Uh, uh, and as usual, Alistair's brilliant summing up of the key points we need to consider. And we heard a lot also about the actual practical um, uh, approaches that some of our speakers are taking to taking things forward and indeed some legislative backdrop to it and how we should uh, react to that. Um, I want to mention a couple of things. Um, I mean, first of all, um, and this is the most extre extreme business challenge that I think any anybody on this call has ever seen. And, uh, and we are all in it together. You know, it's not going to be easy to come out of it, but we are in it together. We're all in the same boat, really. Um, but we should remember that necessity uh, is the mother of all invention. Um, uh, necessity drives change and change drives progress. Um, and, you know, uh, the recent survey from the IOD uh, says that four out of 10 companies have made adjustments to their operating businesses right now that will stay post COVID. Uh, and, and, and it's important to think about that and what that actually means. One in six companies have already launched new products or services uh, into this new dynamic uh, to respond to the change. We're going to see a lot more um, flexible working, as Alistair said, a lot more home working. I'm just thinking about the part equity business. Our business is a venture capital business, but my finance team have been starting work at six o'clock in the morning uh, and finishing at two o'clock in the afternoon because I've got kids in the house. Uh, and effectively, uh, they and their partners are pulling shifts to deal with that. Um, and I think that's going to become kind of normal. I, I think also um, you can't actually uh, avoid the fact that um, the impact of this is just massive acceleration of digitization of everything. You've seen law firms uh, actually doing deals without wet ink, because um, wet ink is simply not practical or possible to get a deal done right now. The only people who don't seem to recognise that are the, uh, the registers and the authorities. <laughs> uh, very difficult to sell a forest when you can't get a wet signature, I can tell you. Um, but we are responding to it. And, and I think what that's going to mean um, across all industries is a change in business models, change in approach, maybe more subscription-based services if you work in service industries like recruitment, um, more remote working. Uh, I think one of our companies, uh, some more CC ones on the call, uh, one of our companies placed somebody uh, for a London-based firm and the, the person concerns lived in Edinburgh, but then they do the job full-time from Edinburgh for a company in London. So I think you'll find that geographic boundaries to where work takes place for companies is going to change a lot, uh, but that creates a lot of opportunities, doesn't it, in terms of flexible workforce. Um, so like Alex, I'll th finish on a positive note uh, and go back to necessity as the mother of all invention. Um, we will come out of this, we'll emerge from it, and there's going to be some really great new opportunities, and certainly from a venture capital standpoint, 
we are starting to focus on the winners of the future and what the business models are going to be. Uh, but thanks for everyone for coming on the call. Uh, it's been a good call again. Thanks again to Jude for uh, arranging, supporting, sponsoring, uh, uh, and uh, introducing uh, as usual. And I hope you all enjoyed it and we'll respond to any questions. Uh, if we don't have much time just now, we can respond afterwards. Over to you, back to you, Jude. Yeah, all the questions have been uh, covered anyhow, particularly there's some coming in for Declan. So, yeah, and Simone helped big time unfold this all together as well. So big thank you to her. Um, that's it. And thank you very much to all the panel. You've been amazing. And uh, I learned so much from all this as well. So thank you very much. And it's always that human interaction part of the week as well, that we get to see other people and hear other voices and stuff as well. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.